North Korea is a land of contrasts, where a morbidly obese dictator who eats so much cheese he now walks with a limp rules over an oppressed population that rarely has enough to eat. It's a country that apparently still uses Cold War era computers the size of arcade machines, but also has the capabilities to hack Sony pictures and leak the news that Spider-Man will be joining the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Truth be told though, the country is so cut off from the rest of the world that it's hard to get a good idea of what life is really like there. And now that they have nuclear capabilities, it's in our best interest to learn as much as possible about this hermit kingdom before it's too late. While in South Korea for the Olympics, I traveled up to the North Korean border, known as the DMZ, hoping to gain new insights on what goes on inside this reclusive nation. And while I did technically step inside North Korea at one point... So those of you on my left will now be standing in communist North Korea. Who are Saturdays for? Yikes. The only takeaways I got from my day at the DMZ was that there's a Popeye's chicken on the South Korean side and that North Korea makes extremely shitty red wine. North Korean blueberry wine. Taste the freedom. Fortunately though, during this tour I met a North Korean defector by the name of Grace Bach. And on the bus ride back from the border, my camera guy, without telling me, arranged for me to do a sit-down interview with her. Despite having never done a serious nor political piece of journalism in my life, I decided to throw on my big J journal hat and give it a go. I'm the Wonton Don. This story today on One Hour. We are here with North Korean defector Grace Bach and her translator. I guess what was the uh, main reason or the final straw when she decided, okay, I need to leave this country? Until 1980, my life was not difficult. I used to be an architect in North Korea and my husband was a government worker. But when the first leader, Kim Jong-un, passed away in 1994, and the second leader, Kim Jong-il, took power, he changed everything because he used most of his budget for nuclear development in the military. There were no more food rations, no more salary. I had to start working at a flea market to feed my family and was worried every day about where our next meal would come from. But as time went by, I was able to collect money again and saved 3 million North Korean won that I want to use for, for my daughter's education. But in 2009, the North Korean government conducted currency forum. After these reforms, my 3 million won become worth only 10,000 won, which could only buy 4 kilograms of rice. I was really, really upset. I couldn't stand it any longer. That's why, at this time, I decided to go to South Korea. Grace explained to me why she left the country and how she was able to do it. I was very lucky because I had an uncle living in China. My uncle gave me a lot of information about defection. He lent me the money that I then paid the border soldiers so they would allow us to cross. We had to wait to do it in the winter so that river on the Chinese border would be frozen. My uncle was waiting across the border with a taxi and then took us to his house in China. We stayed there for three months and then we hired a smuggler to take us to Thailand because China doesn't accept North Korean defectors as refugees. In Thailand, there are 16 nation refugee camps that cooperate with the South Korean government. There we were able to get passports, plane tickets, and then travel to South Korea. We also discussed North Korea's recent participation at the Olympics. At first, when I saw the two Koreas play on the same hockey team at the Olympics, I was very happy. I felt as if we were unified, but I'm very suspicious of Kim Jong-un's ulterior motives. Kim Jong-un is under a lot of pressure from U.S. sanctions. Maybe he is just trying to buy time. We have to be very careful when dealing with his regime because they play a lot of tricks. There's been uh, a lot of media coverage of the North Korean cheerleaders. What type of people do you think in North Korea end up becoming cheerleaders? The cheerleaders are chosen by the government from good family backgrounds. They have to be attractive and not too skinny. The government wants to use them to show that people in North Korea are living very well 
and eating very well. They can be kind of a promotion, a good image for the North Korea region. And she recounted some of the harsh realities of being a North Korean citizen. My college professor was also imprisoned in concentration camp because on a train on his way back from business trip, he said, "What's wrong with this country's economy?" Even his family didn't know that he imprisoned. They had to find out from one of his students. A lot of people in North Korea are missing. They don't know why they have to be jailed just because they talk or complain about the government. Talking to Grace confirmed what the rest of the world already assumed: North Korea is a very shitty place to live. When I was in North Korea, I devoted most of my life to the Kim family. And while I shared her story, like she asked, I really want you to help spread all the stories of North Korean human rights abuse. I wondered if there was anything else I could do to help. Unfortunately, though, seeing as I'm only a lowly blogger and not a volatile ex-NBA player with a penchant for cross-dressing, my access to the Kim family was limited. As a result, I decided to do the next best thing, which was go undercover at a North Korean restaurant chain in China that is directly run by the North Korean government. These restaurants only employ North Korean citizens and exist all around Asia as a way for the regime to bring in badly needed foreign currency. As well as spread propaganda that North Korea does, in fact, have food. We are Canada people. Yeah. Yeah. Boom! Our cover worked like a charm. We were in. While the food and drinks there were pretty much the same as you would find at a South Korean restaurant, except for less tasty and more expensive, the atmosphere was electric. At one point, they even brought my buddy and I up on stage to teach us some dance moves. I don't know if it was just the shitty North Korean booze talking, but I was actually starting to have some fun. But I had to remind myself. That the staff at these restaurants were just like the North Korean cheerleaders Grace told me about. They can be kind of a promotion, a good image for the North Korea region. Propaganda tools used by the government to improve the regime's reputation abroad. I had to remember that I wasn't here to throw mini soccer balls into a basketball hoop. Although that was pretty sweet, I was here to make a difference. So when our waitress brought over a notepad asking for comments and suggestions at the end of the meal, I knew it was time to take action. You want to come? Okay. Well, can you come? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Boom, baby. Mission accomplished. So let it be known: if Trump's meeting with Kim Jong Un is a success, it's because I started lubricating the wheels of change weeks earlier. And if it's a failure, that's because the North Korean waitstaff interpreted my message to mean stop cooking all of their food in the microwave. But hey, at least I tried. <laughs>